why do teens act the way they do? It's one of the biggest mysteries every parent wants to solve and a question teens often grapple with themselves. When we think about why teens act the way they do, we often think about their brains, or their hormones, or perhaps it's those all-encompassing peer relationships driving their decisions. Thinking back to being a teen, or perhaps raising a teenager, it can feel like a roller coaster. I remember feeling like it was the best of times and the worst of times. As a scientist, I think it's a remarkable time. Adolescence is remarkable because it's this beautifully unique period where we are primed to explore. Explore new environments, explore new social relationships, new identities, take new risks, Navigate new levels of social and emotional complexity. Simultaneously, our bodies and brains are changing to support this formative period of learning. We see evidence of this in changes in brain function and maturation. Changes in our thinking, so our weighing risk and reward. And of course, our hormones. Who could forget entering puberty? And all these changes, internally and externally, are interacting with one another to influence what we're exposed to and influence our overall health and well-being. This may mean experimenting with new substances, like alcohol, sleeping less or more, or perhaps just consuming new levels of junk food because you're in charge now. And while adolescence represents this time of increased opportunity, it's also a time of increased vulnerability. It's a time we see an increase in the emergence of psychopathology, like depression. The first onset of a major depressive episode peaks during our adolescent years. And depression, like many other mental health disorders, is a high rate of reoccurring. In other words, adolescents that develop a depressive disorder are at a much higher risk of suffering from depression into adulthood. So, probably wondering at this point, what's the gut got to do with it? But what if I told you there's reason to believe that the microbes in our gut may not only help us understand the teen brain and teen behaviors, but may inform our approach to mental health interventions during this time? Believe me, at first I was a little skeptical myself. As a doctoral student in clinical psychology, really focusing on developmental neuroscience, I would have never guessed that one day my dissertation was going to lead me to swinging around a toilet seat and asking adolescent girls to collect their poop. <laughs> but as my clinical work and research studies progressed, I was convinced we were missing a piece of the puzzle. A metaphor I keep coming back to is imagine you were studying a tree, but you're only focused on the top part. Perhaps how the leaves and branches interacted with the environment, or perhaps are shaped by their access to positive or negative resources. You would learn a lot, but wouldn't you quickly be wondering about the roots? The system with paralleled level of complexity that not only influences the trunk and the top of the tree, but influences and interacts with the environment. That's how I feel we've been approaching our understanding of teen behaviors. We've been missing our roots. So what do I mean? We humans obviously don't have a root system, but we're also not alone. On average, we're a collection of about 30 trillion cells but we actually have an equal number of bacterial cells. Think about that for a second. We're a collection of roughly half human cells and half bacterial cells. And one of the largest populations of these bacterial cells reside in our gut, in our large colon specifically. 
And microbiologists have discovered that these organisms that we originally thought to get rid of are actually part of this entire nervous system, the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system can operate independently of our central nervous system to aid in functions like digestion, but is also interacting and can influence our central and peripheral nervous systems through a number of pathways, such as microbial source metabolites, hormonal signaling, immune function in our cells, or vagal nerve innervation. And this relationship is commonly referred to as the gut-brain axis, or more recently, the microbiome-gut-brain axis, to highlight the role these microbes play in this bidirectional communication. And our understanding of the gut microbiome has already helped to transform some of our approaches to physical health treatments. So fecal transplants, for example, so transferring the poop of one individual to another, can cure certain gastrointestinal diseases, like C. diff or irritable bowel disease. Microbial profiling may open new opportunities to understand which chemotherapy may be best metabolized for an individual. But when it comes to understanding the gut's role in mental health, we're really still at the very beginning, especially if we think about development. And the more we learn about these microbes, both who they are and what they're doing, we're learning that they actually interact and can influence the very systems we know to be changing in adolescence. For example, these fecal transplants have also been shown to reverse some depressive or behavioral um, phenotypes of anxiety. A course of probiotics may change brain function in adults, or a course of chronic antibiotics may disrupt our learning. And in fact, the microbes in our gut, both who's there and how they're functioning, look different than they do in childhood or adulthood. But we really know very little about how the gut is interacting with these systems during this time, during adolescence, when we see this increased opportunity and vulnerability. In fact, much of our understanding of these systems is really still from animal models. But what does it mean to look at these relationships in human development, or more specifically in teens? Here at the University of Oregon, we're starting to tackle some of these questions by bringing together a team of scientists from different disciplines, clinicians, neuroscientists, and microbiologists. We're having adolescent girls come into our lab a few different times as they're transitioning through puberty. One of these visits, we have them do a magnetic resonance imaging scan, or an MRI scan, to, better, to get a better sense of how their brain's functioning when they're doing different tasks. We also do a clinical interview to get a better sense of their social history and mood. And as I hinted at earlier, this also involves asking adolescent girls for a sample of their poop. And I have to say that's one of my favorite successes of the project so far because despite this seemingly taboo topic, especially being an adolescent girl, we're having close to an 85% opt-in rate for girls to give us a poop sample. Meaning, yes, we can translate these studies and we can ask these questions in human teens. And after the girls leave, we start to compile this information to look at brain function, diagnoses, and look at the microbial classifications to understand who is there and what they're doing. And as a team, our goal is to see how is this gut and the microbes in it and their functions relating to the very systems we know to be changing during adolescence, such as social interactions, mood, and brain function. And in particular, if this can give us better insight into why we see this increase in depression during this time. For example, a depressed teen may start to retreat from their friends, stop engaging in activities they once found enjoyable, perhaps change their sleep or eating habits. Does this change the microbes they're exposed to? Or perhaps are there certain microbes that may help explain this change in behavior? Or might these microbes give us better insight into why we're seeing changes in brain function 
for teens with depression versus those who don't, and what those patterns look like. As our understanding of these systems evolves, might we be able to develop behavioral interventions to protect the still developing gut-brain axis from stressors or disruptions? Perhaps some positive or protective factors in the environment that may allow us to intervene at these early stages, helping to mitigate one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. We're still at the early stages of looking at these connections within our lab, but this question is bigger than any one study and will take a collective effort to answer. Now more than ever, I believe by collaborating and asking these questions from multiple and complementary angles, we can have the biggest impact on adolescent well-being. Adolescence is a time of great promise. Let's tap into it. And I don't think we'll get there until we start including what we know about the other half of the cells residing within us until we figure out what's the gut got to do with it. Thank you.